All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll give everyone a couple minutes here uh, to jump on. But in the meantime, we have a fun, fun question in the chat. One, we'd love to know where you're calling in from that traditional webinar uh, ask there. And two, Rich and I were just discussing this. What is your favorite band or favorite artist? And maybe even what was the first CD or first tape, depending on, you know, how long you've been in the game uh, that you purchased? So annoyingly, we just asked uh, Sarah, who is the brains behind this, uh, well, one of the two sets of brains behind this, not Alex and I, but the, uh, uh, she's just saying the chat is disabled, is enabled. Um, so and we, annoyingly, Sarah's answer to that was, I didn't have CDs, I had an iPod. So which made me instantly feel incredibly old. So thanks for that, Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm looking at a couple CDs um, over on my wall as well. I've got a couple uh, running around there. Awesome. We'll just give everyone another minute to jump on. I see the participant number still climbing. I think we might have an issue with the chat. One second. All right, yeah, we're going to get this chat going, everyone, and then... Stand by, I'm just working on working on the chat here. Sorry, everyone, we'll be two seconds. Right, Alex, do you want to start and we'll we'll get that fixed in the background. Um, yeah, no we can, problem. We can crack on. And um, The Q&A is working. So if anybody's got any questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A panel because Alex and I will get to those um, as quick as we can. If you put them in the Q&A rather than the chat, obviously the chat's not working at the moment. So you can put them there if you wanted to. But if you use the Q&A channel, we'll make sure that we get to those answers um, and we'll answer them either um, directly by responding to them or we'll um, kind of bring them up and actually answer them live as well as we're going through some of these points. So please do ask questions as we're going through because um, it's important uh, right, uh, give something a bit more to the webinar if we're going through and we actually get a bit of response from you guys and we can see like what's important to you as well. Right, over to you, Alex. For sure. Well, Rich, I'm so excited to get started uh, and talk all things sales excellent with Six and Flow today. So we're going to be going through five really key steps that I think you can take to your office, uh, to your couch, through Slack, wherever you're working to help take your sales game to the next level using HubSpot. Now, uh, before I get started, I want to take a minute to introduce myself as well as our main speaker today. Uh, my name is Alex. I work here at HubSpot in product marketing, and I'm so excited to be joined by Rich Wood, CEO of Six and Flow, an elite solutions partner for HubSpot, who's actually based in the UK. I'm sitting here based in Cincinnati, Ohio in the States. Uh, and we'll learn a little bit more about Six and Flow in a second. But Rich, I wanted to turn things over to you uh, to maybe tell us a bit about yourself as well as Six and Flow. Yeah, so I'm I'm based over uh, here in Manchester. Um, so Six and Flow is actually uh, so we've been around since 2015. We've got um, uh, and I, I promise everyone this bit will be super quick because I appreciate that you're not actually here to learn about Six and Flow. Um, so I get it. That's uh, not a problem. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of quick background to, so you can understand why I'm here with Alex talking to you about RevOps. So we have offices based in Manchester, London, Dublin, and Toronto. We also have some team members out in South Africa and in Japan. Uh, we're one of the first elite HubSpots uh, here in EMEA, elite HubSpot partners here in EMEA. And for the last two years, we've been the global number one independent HubSpot partner. Basically, what that means is that we know what we're talking about with HubSpot. Uh, we know it really well. We work really closely with them. And as an agency, we support high growth clients in the B2B tech, SaaS and professional services space where they go to market needs. So everything from strategic marketing through to RevOps through to CRM and integrations. 
And one of the reasons, Rich, I'm so excited to work with you and talk with Six and Flow in particular is because you are doing some pretty cool work across a lot of our HubSpot customer bases. You can see a couple here. Um, I think you've helped companies with large rollouts, structured HubSpot with multiple global business units and integrations. So I know Six and Flow stays pretty busy. And I think everyone here can see some of those really cool customers that you're working with on a regular basis, especially that customer in the middle uh, I'm a big fan of. <laughs> um, I, I promise everyone, this is the last uh, classic agency slide that we're going to put in front of you. Um, we just wanted to put up a few of the logos. So you can kind of see that the space that we're working in, um, like the, the, the customers that we're helping with RevOps and CRM and things like that as well. So um, I wanted to start with this. Sales has a problem. But before we actually get going, we want to know what's the top challenge you see in sales at the moment? So to start off with, we're going to put a poll up for you. And hopefully this will show for everybody. But we want to talk about what is the biggest challenge you're seeing? Is it prospecting, qualifying leads, avoiding discounts, closing deals, hitting target, lack of efficiency, or perhaps something else? So give us a quick answer in the poll. Um, it seems to be different for everyone at the moment. For us at Six and Flow, we're seeing a lot of deal slippage, not necessarily closed lost, but our sales cycles are getting longer than they used to be. And of course, post-pandemic, uh, prospecting is, and especially cold calling is getting much harder because obviously it's harder to get hold of those uh, kind of uh, office based numbers. So while we're waiting for people to answer that, what's HubSpot seeing, Alex? Yeah, so I think that's everything you've touched on is so relevant. We're seeing deal cycles, I think, really extend more people being bought into that decision making process as well. And then I think just in general, like what we've seen with a lot of our different customers is just, you know, as well as partners is it's been really, really hard to hit targets um, and just to make those quotas and things like that. So again, you can't say macroeconomic climate enough, but we're continuing to see that pressure for sure. So uh, what is interesting, we pretty pretty even poll there. Um, I'll share the results with everyone. Pretty even poll there with uh, between prospecting, qualifying, and a lack of efficiency. I think um, I think prospecting for us, like we talked about at the beginning, is is one of those like key challenges across the board at the moment because the way that we're selling, and we'll go into this in a bit, but the way that we're selling now has had to change because it isn't always, I mean, with work from home, um, all those elements coming into it, it is a very different process now. Thanks for the answers on that, everybody. All right, let me just get rid of that poll. So the problem for sales, as we're seeing it across the market, is broken down to uh, four main areas. Prospects are getting harder to reach. It's a perfect storm for people working from home. So cold calling is far more challenging than it used to be. People are becoming attuned to ignoring channels like DMs. Uh, like LinkedIn DMs are the prime example here. We're all getting hit with recruiters and lead generators and with that uh, templated outreach. Um, and being honest, sales messaging has gotten really, really lazy across the board. Um, across a number of markets, for us and for our clients, we're seeing lower performance in 2023 than was forecasted. Across tech and SaaS, there was a huge surge in growth during the pandemic, but now we're seeing a slower market. As reps and managers, we're not, just not hitting those goals consistently anymore. We're still getting those big wins across the line, but consistently hitting target month in and month out is becoming much more of a challenge. And the biggest challenge of all in my opinion, is those stagnant budgets. A lot of budgets have shrunk, right? So what we used to expect would either grow or at least be a consistent budget. A lot of those things are starting to contract now. And for Six and Flow in particular, we're seeing the CFO and the sales process more and more. And that's a pretty good indicator that the budgets are tighter and the pennies and pounds or dollars uh, are being watched closely. And facing all of that is making sales much, much harder the capital off all the channels, tools, tactics, the information we need to be more effective is becoming harder and harder to come by. And that is a tr $2 trillion problem. That's how much we're leaving on the table through the wasted investment in underperforming marketing and sales activity and a do more mentality. So we were going to ask for an honest show of hands, but unfortunately, I still don't have the chat uh, working, unfortunately. So this is going to be a fairly one-sided conversation other than the Q&A. But um, from a sales leadership and management perspective, who recognizes some of these questions here? 
first one, we didn't hit our numbers and I don't know why. I'm trying these phone numbers, but the data is all wrong. The team forecasted a, a lot, but we only managed to hit 25% of it. I have two deals that are pretty much the same, but I don't know where to prioritize my effort. John says he is following the process, but not hitting because of luck. Is he right? James is focusing on the wrong deals and losing his, um, his high chance opportunities, chasing whales. So, hang on, sorry, one second. And the answer to that across most sales team historically has been, we'll just do more, more calls, more emails, more BDRs in the process. And that is a massive mistake. We're going to go into a bit about why. Uh, sorry, uh, our team in the background just told me there is no three dots under the chat, um, Sarah. Um, tried to fix it, but it's not going to work. We'll just, we'll just assume that you're all listening intently and want to ask us questions. So that's fine. But what sales really has is a relationship problem in that we don't account for them in our analysis and forecasting. When you think about how we sell and what the foundations are to business, it boils down to the humans in the process. It's all about people and the relationships we foster with those people. But importantly, it's about having the right relationships with the right people across your prospect organizations. And looking at how many of those relationships you have, are you just relying on a single point of contact or have you built relationships across the decision-making unit within an organization? If it's just one person, we end up with that night, nightmare scenario, uh, scenario. What happens if that champion leaves? Or worse still, what happens if the rep that you employ leaves owning that relationship? So what does a modern sales engagement look like? It's a systematic process for communicating with prospects in a manner that breaks through the noise. It's not the boilerplate uh, point, sorry, stumbling over my own words there. It's not the boilerplate spray and pray LinkedIn DMs, but it is structured, measurable, and repeatable. Modern engagement is about connecting through the right channels with the right messaging, with the right relevance, and at the right time. But let's be honest, if you're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, then you're just contributing to the snow blindness, that noise that's going on that people just can't get to grips with. And your sales process definitely needs to rethink. So every sales team has its high, mid, and low performers. You have the rock stars that have found their groove and built a consistent pipeline, landing those whales in the 11th hour to blow away the target. You have the hit and miss mid-level performers, and you have those that are struggling to hit target at all. What we're talking about here is moving all of those performers to consistently deliver, hitting target quarter in, quarter out. How we do that is by learning from what is working and what's not and using process technology and data to support them in being consistent. So how do we get to that point? Uh, well, that's where we get to the title of uh, this webinar, Five Steps to Replicating Excellence. So we need to know the starting point, essentially what's going on across your organization and what tools and processes you have in place you need to perform a RevOps health check. You need to understand what is going on in the business and what is your starting point effectively. You need a standardized, uh, you need standardized data that's easily consumed by reps, management, and leadership. You need to standardize how you qualify ops. How can you accurately or reliably forecast, forecast across a team if deals are qualified differently? Top performers are often overlooked. Their landing deals lead to it. That's it, it's something that we've heard across all of the, the sales orgs that we've ever worked in. That top performer is doing the job they need to do. Let's leave them alone. But you need to have consistent review meetings with them, not to get in their way, but to see where you can support, possibly, but also to give the wider team an understanding and an opportunity to learn from what they're doing and how they're performing and how they can then get better in that process as well. And finally, and as unsexy as it sounds for the top billers amongst you, Consistent sales is driven by a well-structured sales methodology. You need that method in place. You need it drilled into the team, how they understand what are the steps and the processes that they need to follow. So step one, the health check. For us at Six and Flow, a health check is about determining the state of play, how mature your organization is in a RevOps process, and basically what's in place and how it's being used. It's difficult to know how to get where you're going without actually understanding where you are. So that is the starting point that we use when we start to look at RevOps. 
when we run our RevOps health checks, we break them down into three parts. And don't worry, uh, we'll be sharing the deck and the webinar recording. So don't feel like you have to scribble any of this down. I know there's a lot of words on the page and people often get panicked when they see that kind of stuff. But we will share this stuff uh, after so you will be able to see it. The split for us comes down to three parts, outcomes, tactics, and stakeholders. With the outcomes, what are we trying to achieve at this stage? It might be as a simple, it might be as simple as running a health check, or perhaps you're starting to see some traction and deploying additional elements, or you may be building out more sophisticated processes in an aim to increase velocity in your sales pipeline, or RevOps may now be a core part of your business. And that's a great, great position to be in. Tactics, what are you doing? Do you have a sales process? How mature is it? Is your CRM working for you? Or is the admin overload working against you and getting those deals closed? What's your reporting like? Is it a full funnel? Is your reporting full funnel or are you just tracking the base metrics? And then finally, stakeholders. Who within your organization is involved? Does it have senior buy-in or is it still being implemented by a single champion? Essentially, how entrenched is RevOps across your team from rep through to CEO? The health check is one of the most important parts if you ask me. Um, the health check for us is one of the most important parts of the process. So going deep and understanding what's going on across your revenue teams, which tools you have in place and how you're using data is the only way you're going to build a successful robot foundation in your organization. So once we understand where you are as a business and who in your, uh, then we need to understand who in your business will make RevOps successful. In short, anyone who touches your revenue generation is going, uh, anyone who touches your revenue generation, but there's some common examples uh, kind of listed out for you here as well. For RevOps to work, you need a sales leader who's data-driven to opt optimize sales performance, and that performance needs to align with the overall objective of the business. They'll set the strategic direction for revenue generation, quite often with a senior marketer, but we do need somebody who's going to be leading that from a sales perspective. Then we have uh, the sales manager. They should be there to empower the team. They're there to coach, but coaching with insight, not just gut feel and that classic, that's the way we've always sold. They're there to advocate for the sales team, but to also move blockers out of the way. And that moving blockers out of the way is the important bit. That's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give sales reps more time to actually close deals. The reps, they're about execution. They're there to implement a scalable uh, sales process. They're there at the coal face of sales and should be using the data they're seeing to work with the sales manager to continually improve their sales process. And perhaps most importantly, they're feeding that insight back to the marketer. Last, but definitely not least on the list is the marketer. Uh, your marketing team should have a North Star metric that's aligned with sales and ultimately driving revenue growth. They should be intrinsically aligned with sales and often sit as part of the sales team, helping enable sales team uh, the sales team with their opportunities. To give you some insight on in how we uh, we manage our revenue team within Six and Flow, marketing and sales are both aligned in a single growth team with both being targeted on revenue. So we have that intrinsic uh, alignment where everybody is pushing for the same goal and looking at how they can feed into it together. But the key message here is that RevOps should not be um, executed in isolation. That's the thing that you need to take away from this slide. Rich, I love that. And when you're talking about not executing things in isolation, one of the biggest things I think is visibility, right? And that's what this next step is all about, which is sales reporting. Um, do want to encourage everyone, we do have the Q&A open. If you have any thoughts, have any questions, just head to the bottom of Zoom, hit Q&A, uh, throw them in there. We'd love to see those. I'm going to save some time at the end. So Rich, I think scaling is top of mind for all of those. And I think without some of those critical insights, metrics, and results, you're going to have a really hard time reaching your goals. Now, I'm sure we all have several tabs open on our computer of different reports, spreadsheets, Google Sheets, and graphs, just trying to keep tabs on how we're doing. Now, if I am a rep, I'm going to want some insight into all of my activities, leads, and deals. So here are some key reports that I think you'll definitely want to bookmark. And again, as Rich said, these slides are going to be sent out. So don't worry about writing all of them down. But keep in mind that with Sales Hub and with HubSpot, you're going to have the ability to actually create almost any report using custom reports. And that can be tailored to your specific business situation. You can see here actually on the slide is a really good example from Six and Flow around relationship prioritization. They've actually gone in and created a report that overlays things like traditional lead scoring, with relationship scoring. In this report, reps and managers are actually able to review and prioritize 
and determine activity for some of those high intent prospects. So Rich, I might actually have to steal this one uh, for us at HubSpot as well. Um, this is actually one of my favorite charts to roll up requires as well. It very quickly gives the sales team insight into where they need to prioritize activity um, and where there's uh, potential for deal slippage and where they should be leaning into their wider team. That alone can bring dramatic improvements into their closed rates. So it's, it's one of those nice, quick wins in the process. So as long as we've got data in there and we can build those reports, they can actually start to see the things that they can action. I love that. And I think when you talk about close rates, there is nothing that sales managers are going to want to care more about there. So the good news is that Sales Hub and HubSpot have a lot of reporting here as well. So just like for sales reps, where we have some of those key reports you want to take a look at, we've broken out a couple highlights here that sales managers specifically will want to pay attention to. They focus on things that Rich touched on, like revenue generation, lead management, and segmentation. So as a manager, I'd like to pay close attention to several of those rep level reports, like closed one, deal size, sales cycle, to really get that rep level performance, as well as improve, uh, as well as inform some of those coaching conversations. And Rich, I think we are, we've got the chat, chat open right now. We've got the chat. We've got the chat. It's not like have the, the chat. webinar that we've all run since the pandemic. So apologies about that, everybody. You are all good. Well, everyone, I would love to see you jump in the chat. Let us know your thoughts. You can still say where you're from for sure, um, but definitely keep engaging as we're going through here. But again, for sales leaders, um, we have done something similar for you. So finally, if I'm in that leadership position, whether that be sales, marketing, or rev ops or executive leadership, I'm going to need quick insight into my team's performance. I don't need to spend time drilling down into each deal, each rep, or each task. So here, here are some of the high-level reports at each stage of the sales journey that I would definitely bookmark, particularly around things like activities. The new prospecting activities report is actually going to allow you as a leader to go in and measure the effectiveness and impact that various sales motions are having. Think things like meeting rate efficiency, uh, close rate for people who've executed a certain amount of calls. It's really going to allow you to help refine your sales motions. Also, I want to call out, not just for leaders, but for managers as well, things like coaching playlists and conversation intelligence help you drill down into that actual conversation some of your top performers or maybe even some of your bottom performers are having. And you can use that to not only highlight best practices, but really tweak performance as well. So please be sure not to pass that up. Got a nice couple of waves in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, nice to see you, Andrew. Tom, thanks for the chat and thanks for joining. And Jasper, I have seen your question. We will come back to that. Awesome. So step three now moving on is one of my favorites because it can be so nuanced, I think, and really changes based on your business. But it is so critical to try and standardize your qualification method. Now, when we talk about qualification, right, of course, we have terms like MQL and SQL, two terms whose meaning I found really changes and is greatly debated based on who you're talking to uh, that day. But for today, what we are talking about is the method of qualifying your leads and ultimately turning those leads into deals as they move further down the sales funnel. You know, it can be really hard, you know, as a sales rep to uncover some needs, get pain points and use cases and solution with a customer live and on a call without some sort of programmatized template that your SDRs or reps can use to get that info. Playbooks here, uh, you can see one that Six and Flows created uh, right here on the slide, are a great feature that'll actually allow you to help bring some consistency to your sales process. You can set playbooks up for things like introduction calls, discoveries, demos, or really any situation. So your reps can actually work through that process as they're engaging with that customer or the prospect and do it in a consistent basis. Not only that, but it's going to give the reps the right questions to ask and a place to record responses, which will help you gather even more data. And I think actually even uncover some more insights. So definitely do not pass these up. The nice thing about playbooks as well, in, in whatever format you use them, obviously you use them in a sales process, you can use them in a, a CS process. But I think the nice thing about it is it makes a lot of the data entry part of the natural conversation as well. So yes, it's giving you prompts. These are the things you to ask, but also it gives you an understanding of, okay, here is where I put that data in that then populates a CRM. So we can remove some of those data entry elements as we're going through that process. Definitely. Um, Alex, I've just seen your question in the chat as well. Anyone have playbooks set up for their sales process? Oh, that, that is you, Alex, not- That is me, Alex. Yeah, yes, Alex. I wanted to hear. 
Wow. Anyone in the chat, if you have any sales playbooks, we would love to hear how you've been using playbooks or anything else. Right, back to me. Um, so when we get to step four, introducing a sales, uh, so then we get to step four, introducing a sales methodology. Again, it's an interactive show and we've actually got chat working now. So a quick show of hands in the chat. Who here thinks that they have a well-defined sales methodology and it's being used across their sales team? So if, just, if you put a, a hand up in the uh, chat, that would be amazing. And Alex and I can uh, have a look. Um, Alex, I know you're not on the sales team at HubSpot, but any insight into the sales methodologies being thrown around on the sales floor? Uh, definitely, yes. So we work very closely with our with our sales team here at HubSpot. And of course, one of the things that we have uh, is a whole inbound methodology. So a lot of what our team focuses their time on are working some of those inbound leads. Um, one process that I know they do have is they have, I can't remember the name for it. It's this idea where you block certain amounts of time on your calendar um, to batch prospecting, to batch deal management, or to batch uh, analyzing your data. So they kind of structure their day with a lot of time blocks to really help them work through some of the key elements of the sales process. And Rich, we've got a couple, you know, lots of thumbs down. I started with a muscle in the chat for a sales methodology, but I think we've got a lot of thumbs down coming in here. Yeah, I'm surprised actually. I thought there would have been more kind of positive, uh, like as in people saying, yeah, we have got them in place. So it's, it's interesting to see actually. Um, Kirsty, great. That's good to see as well. Okay. So with sales methodologies, there's hundreds, if not thousands, right? They're, I mean, you could talk about BAM, Spice, uh, MedPay, all of these kind of things. But we're not here to promote any of them in particular, but I am going to walk you through what we use at Six and Flow and how we typically work with a client. We start with a qualification framework, and historically we use things like BAM, GBCT. I'm sure a lot of you will recognize those, and hopefully those of you using sales um, methodologies will have moved on from some of those because there's some obvious flaws, but a good starting point nevertheless. But over the last 18 months, we've moved away from MedPIC in our growth org. These stats are all MedPIC specific, but they acutely illustrate what happens when you start to use a framework consistently. So teams using MedPIC increase their win rates by 311% on average. High performers are four times more likely to actually complete qualification criteria, giving the wider teams insight to improve across the board and aiding in the reduction of uh, SOPs team stress levels, which I can imagine get very high towards the end of the quarter. Um, and when compared to using uh, just using metrics and de uh, decision criteria, there's a 206% increase in win rate. Uh, shout out to the guys at Ebster. This A lot of this data comes from their uh, annual sales benchmarking report. Um, but frameworks are hugely impactful, especially when we surface the data to reps and managers. We start to dig into why those high performers are closing deals, which, influence, uh, which then influences training, process, and quite often all the way down to things like sales scripting. We, we can determine positive and negative behaviors, and we can use that to build data-driven performances across the team. Processes are good and all. Like we can build all these nice shiny things, but there's no point in having these fancy tools if they're not being used. So how do we actually ensure adoption of these? So for us, we break it down into four parts. Introduce a qualification store, score, create a qualification report. We use AI uh, to summarize uh, things like sales notes. That's, that's a, I, I know that sounds a bit almost like gimmicky or uh, kind of tool based at this point, but what that does is it helps us reduce um, the admin, I'll go into a bit more detail, but we can reduce some of the admin that sales teams are going through, but also give them something quite cool to play with. And that inherent excitement or playfulness of using something will often help with some of that adoption as well. And then we get into setting up pipelines and lead automation. So by using framework, it gives us the basis to start to score our qualification process and standardize the approach. The questions we're asking are, have we confirmed the key elements and who within the organization confirmed them? That who bit is super important because it could be the champion, it could be the decision maker, or it could be just somebody else in the process. And we want to make sure that we are stack ranking the quality of that affirmation at that point. Um, these things build up a score and enable us to prioritize stack rank and dashboard out deal probability and where sales teams should focus their efforts because sometimes it might just be uh, part of the normal sales process but sometimes those things will start to um, uh, highlight that we need to start engaging more people within that relationship and making sure that people are um, uh, engaged in that process 
So Rich, I think once you have that score though, it's really, really important then to create the right reporting to measure your qualification efforts. So utilize some of those custom reporting tools in HubSpot to set up the reports that work for you and will actually give you visibility into that qualification process that Rich was just talking about. This, these these reports, I mean, I, I love a good like bubble report anyway. I really like how they look, but they can surface information that is, that by surfacing that data, it gives managers the a very quick way in it maybe in a one-to-one -one, but even on a, a team basis to highlight and then coach around what these deals uh, uh, whether or not these deals are going to come across and how we can better increase the velocity across the pipeline so we can very quickly see okay this is a high value deal but actually the relationship isn't there for that deal so you're telling me you're forecasting this but actually the data is telling us that this isn't likely to close because you don't have all of the key markers based around uh, that in our normal sales process that we would expect to see on a deal like this that it, you're telling me is going to close soon. So having that data surface is super important. And it wouldn't be a webinar in 2023 without someone mentioning AI. Um, so I'm glad it got to be me. Um, in a sales process, there are countless ways you can use AI, everything from research through to creative through to analysis i think anybody on this call can imagine different ways you can use things like chat gpt and uh, all that to help you either write, write sales copy or uh, analyze data but one of the ways that we use ai in our sales process at city flow is taking our sales notes or call transcripts passing them to ai and using it to categorize what we've heard in our sales qualification framework why do we do that well because it removes that layer of admin for the sales team. And let's be honest, sales team avoid admin like cats avoid baths. It brings in a layer of consistency and ease that works for everybody. So the, the sales managers get to see more data in the CRM, sales ops get to see more data in the CRM, but also we can then surface that data to then make intelligent decisions about how we're running that sales process. You made it pretty far, Rich, without mentioning AI. Um, so yeah. I think good job. 20 minutes of uh, relief from AI here. So finally, one of the key things here for successful adoption uh, is setting up your pipelines. And with Sales Hub and now with HubSpot, that doesn't just mean your deals, right? Uh, in case you missed it at Inbound, we launched some really exciting new prospecting and leads features that let you actually manage all of your prospecting motions in Sales Hub. So just like you set up your deals, and your different deal stages and automations, take time to set up your lead stages and those automations there to make sure that your leads and deals are moving through the pipeline as your team uh, are working on them. So again, just be sure to set up that lead automation as well as the deal automation now. Finally, step five, um, we talked about top performers a lot. And I think one of the key things here is really being able to learn from those top performers. Each of us likely has, I think, those couple key reps or leaders we go to uh, to learn from. We ask them things like, what's working? Where are you seeing success? What are your biggest opinions on you know, the latest campaign we just sent out, even though sometimes they probably don't like it? We probably go to them you know, a bit too much, to be honest, but it's for a good reason. So here are some key things that we like to ask when it comes to our top performers. So first, remember those coaching tools I discussed a while ago? things like conversational intelligence and coaching playlists, they're actually going to allow you for these top performers to jump in and learn from them without having to send them a Slack or a Teams ping and bug them. And speaking of these coaching playlists, you can actually string together call highlights and share with the rest of your sales team. So again, I think being able to use this to uncover what's working in those conversations that your top performers are having, but then also take those conversations and share the highlights with your entire team uh, is one of the most powerful ways to use the feature and also bring that top performer experience to the rest of your sales org. So the second though, is all about what questions are these top performers asking to progress deals, right? What's their questioning strategy? What are they asking at each different opportunity to move that prospect through the deal stage? Third is sales methodology. A good one that Rich touched on was MedPick, but I believe we'll drop in the chat uh, to check out. But I think with all of the different sales influencers, uh, resources, and different tips and tricks out there, you're going to be bound to learn something about sales methodology and sales process in general just by talking to and watching your top performers. Fourth is a tough one, but a really, really important one, and that is objection handling, right? Something we all run into in sales. 
what are the strategies your top performers are using to deal with those objections? Maybe they're doing something a bit different that the rest of the team isn't when they're faced with those typical things like, you know, cost, the right people to buy in and things like that. What's their strategy to overcome some of those other ones that your other reps aren't able to get past? Speaking of objections, fifth is the buying committee, which as we've talked about earlier, seems to be getting larger and taking longer. Uh, do they have strategies for looping in the right stakeholders or keeping things moving? Or do they have different ways that they work a large committee when things are getting too big and too many people are bought in? Who are they pulling in from your own company side to help close deals? And then wrapping it up is six, which is just about reporting and specifically deal value and sales cycle by rep, right? We want to be able to see for these top performers, you know, how are they progressing deals through the pipeline? How fast are they doing it? What's the size of the deal? And by having this level of data, um, you'll be able to get some insights from those top performers on how they're performing and what they're doing differently. And actually, we have one more, which is seven as a last one. How much time are their leads spending at each stage? I think this is a really fascinating one when we look at it, HubSpot too. We'll go not only into lead stage, but deal stage as well. And we'll see for those different performers, how long are their people sitting in those stages? how many people are dropping off from stage to stage, and we'll be able to see how they're working their pipeline, right? And I think those with those seven questions and seven quick tips, you can really learn a lot from some of your top performers. Alex, I'm totally going to go off piece, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I think you'll know the answer to this. But how, so HubSpot is a, a large and mature sales org now. So there's like a, a lot of layers, regional um, kind of um, uh, uh, segment based, all those kind of things. Who in the org is going through that time and stage with the reps? Is it just a team manager? Is sales op looking at it? Like what level does that kind of analysis typically go up to in a mature sales org? That's a great question. And yes, one, one I love. Yeah, we have a global sales org. I don't know the number. I think HubSpot total employees is around 8,000 now. Don't quote me on that. Um, but when it comes to looking at a level of data, it's something that the management team directly on their individual teams, I think, are going to be looking at, right? They're able to see, say I've got eight, nine, 10 reps on my team, go in and see, okay, whose deals, um, whose contacts are spending the most time at each deal stage, who's losing the most at certain stages, and I think learning from there. Um, we have a really collaborative sales organization as well. So in the larger segment, you know, director, VP level, they're always using these reports to share learnings and share kind of like best practices. But I think a lot of this reporting would be done um, at the manager level and maybe the director level as well. That's a great question. All right, well, speaking of sales leaders, uh, fantastic, couldn't have picked up. That was a question. nice segue, it was totally on yeah. <laughs> Um, And looking at all this content, here's what I think I would need to do then as a sales leader, right? First, um, at HubSpot, I think, you know, if you're a sales leader, you need to really recognize that you're in charge of the strategic direction of the team. Oh, if you can hit the next slide, Rich, please. Um, not just the goals and the forecasting of the team, but also the team culture as well. Uh, speaking of sales teams at HubSpot, they each have their own Slack channel for some of the bigger segments. So sometimes I'll drop in and just see how everyone's working together. Um, it's really cool to see the culture that sales leaders have been able to build um, just by, you know, engaging with their team. So as a leader, though, I really need to work to make sure that I'm removing obstacles and that my teams are spending less time on admin and more time on actually selling. And I think part of that, and Rich, something you probably deal with a lot, is making sure that you're able to maximize the ROI from any software investment, not just HubSpot, but anything you're getting your sales teams to use and really giving them the tools they need to actually hit their goals and not just take up their time uh, with admin and additional clicks. There's, there's nothing worse than burning budget with uh, shiny tech tools that don't actually get implemented or used. And I'm definitely guilty of that in my time. That is, uh, I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> so as a sales rep, then maybe, especially someone using HubSpot, I think there are a couple of things that I would really focus on. The first is scaling and automating prospecting activities. Now, I'm not talking about pointless personalization or spamming people with generic emails written with AI, but really building thoughtful sequences and outreach campaigns that really help take a lot of that manual outreach and back and forth off of your plate, but also provide a tailored experience and one with context to each of your prospects. So I think using those sequences and those automation tools, you can build some really engaging pre-sales and sales flows there. I also wanna make sure that my communication is centralized by connecting my phones and my calendars 
an email to Sales Hub. And also, if you use Outlook, I think, or Gmail, you'll actually get our cool content assistant right there in your email if you're connecting it. So cool feature to have. Um, and I'd also want to make sure that when I'm talking about structuring my day, something I talked about earlier was time blocking, um, that I'm using things like task queues or workspaces in Sales Hub to really organize my day and structure my time. Finally, sales analytics. We've talked about it so much. We love it. Um, as a rep, I would be in there at reports and looking at, you know, what customers am I engaging with? You know, how is my messaging? How is my outreach landing? How are my meetings performing? My emails and my calls? I'm really using that to refine uh, your sales methods. And finally, I would not forget some of our integration partners. There are, I mean, there's a plus a thousand, I think, for Sales Hub. Um, and there are so many great ones that do everything from enablement, calling, um, you know, sales tools. So I would just make sure that you're plugged in to the Sales Hub app marketplace and leveraging some of those great partners that work really well with Sales Hub. So if you focus on these five steps, the health check, sales data and dashboards, bringing in standardized methodology, implementing review meetings and uh, with top performance and introducing a sales methodology, you'll be well on your way to replicating sales excellence across your revenue generating team. The good news is though, once you understand where you're at with your RevOps process, there's a ton of quick wins and incremental gains you can start to roll out. This isn't something that you have to go all in with immediately. You don't have to do everything at once, but once you understand the baseline of where you're starting from, there are a lot of quick wins. It could just be as much as surfacing data and reports. It could be understanding your process and where there's elements. So like the, the time and stage that very quickly gives you analysis of, okay, how can we start to grease the wheels in that stage a bit more? And you will see those incremental gains and those quick wins starting to come through. That's the good news. It's something that can be done pretty quickly. And that's us. Um, we put a little bonus in here. Um, so visit this link or scan the QR code or just wait for the inevitable uh, follow-up email post um, uh, webinar. Uh, it'll take you to free online RevOps maturity assessment. Uh, it should help get you started. Um, it'll give you a bit of insight of kind of where you sit um, uh, based on kind of your current activity. Alex, thanks for joining me. It's been fun to hang out and thanks to everyone for listening. We do have time for questions now and we've got a couple of um, questions um, trying to fire away, um, well, to kind of respond to. But if anybody's got any more questions, stick in the Q&A. Um, Alex and I are more than happy to answer them. Um, as uh, We've got one here, Alex, from Jasper. I yeah. joined a scale-up. I joined a scale up as CRO and have a team of six senior salespeople who are kicking off sales in isolation the last six over the last six months. How can I best build out a RevOps team structure at this point? The product has gone live this year. Um, I'll, I'll um, try and answer that first, Alex, and then you jump in. I would say there's, there's a huge amount of caveats off the back of that, um, Jasper, to begin with, is uh, we need to understand what the wider organization looks like, who you're targeting, how you're targeting, what is the actual go-to-market strategy? Is there a marketing team that you're working alongside? How how do you function together? Are you aligned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would also say is quite often, do you need in that early stage an entire RevOps function in place? Can you progress with a sales team and then start to bring in some of these elements. Can you become more RevOps focused as opposed to kind of building out a team and then move into that? Because sometimes like it is, it can be a substantial investment to actually bring in a RevOps person or bring in some of the tool sets. So I would I would start to look at your like the elements within that. So like looking at your your processes, your methodologies, the tool sets you're using, surfacing that data, and then start to formalize that over time would be my opinion. Having know nothing about the organization other than there's six of you over the last six months. Alex? Yeah, Rich, I think you said it really well. I thought more, I thought back to that slide you had originally where you had like the four key players of RevOps as well and just being able to drive that alignment. But I think you touched on it really, really well. Um, Sarah, we just got a question in through the chat as well. And Rich, I think this is a good, this is a really good one for you. Do you have any suggestions maybe on fostering a culture of ownership uh, where teams become proactive and self-driven to really get some more of those top performers we talked about a lot earlier? Yeah, so I would, I how we do this and how we've done it, it, it and uh, being kind of honest and transparent, it was a learning process for us. We've tried a lot of things over time. We have, uh, but what we do across the organization is everybody has a number. Everybody has a metric that they are 
um, that they own and can influence. And it's that can influence bit being the most important. There's no point giving somebody a metric that they actually cannot affect because it's not going to drive behaviors and it's not going to do anything to the company either. So everybody across our organization has a number that they can affect and is feeding into the wider uh, business. And when we start to look at our revenue generating teams, we often make sure that those numbers are aligned. Well, we always make sure those numbers are aligned. So like I mentioned it earlier, so across the sales and marketing team, they each have revenue targets. So our, our sales team have their um, um, kind of, will close one amount that they are targeted with each month and then we have our uh, marketing team they have um, marketing influenced revenue that they have to generate as well but there's a clear crossover there and what that does is two things somebody has ownership over their number that that is their thing that is the thing that they are trying to deliver on but it also gives them license to push each other internally as well so now that we have marketing generated revenue as one of our targets Marketing cannot close those uh, that revenue without sales. So they are now chasing and pushing sales as much as we are as a leadership team because they are targeted on that as well. And that that ownership and alignment really starts to drive the positive behaviors and from a growth perspective within the organization. I think that's a that's a great answer. We have something similar here where, you know, we even in marketing, you're not necessarily responsible for, you know, those closing those deals, but you do influence and you have a commitment to the sales team to pass over a certain number yep. of quality leads and ensure that they're getting some sort of, you know, metric of a close rate that you're not just throwing them leads that, you know, aren't closable. So Rich, I think you tackled that really well. Um, did have a question come in through the chat. We talked earlier on AI and you use it for uh, note taking, which uh, or summarizing calls, which I thought was great. Are there any other trends that you're seeing when you're working with some of your clients as to how people are using AI, particularly for the sales process? Yeah, I think probably the most common one, and there's there's part of me that loves it and part of me that hates it. Um, but I think is uh, using generative AI to actually help with sales outreach. Now, I think I'm I'm not a big fan of the kind of click a button, spray and pray. Um, uh, process because I think yes it becomes a numbers game the more volume you will get some positives over time but you will also be burning a lot of opportunities that you're not aware of through that process but there is a case for as, as long as you get good at uh, script um, uh, sorry prompt scripting uh, or architecture or whatever you want to call it there is a space for you to feed in details, somebody's LinkedIn page, um, information, articles, things like that about a prospect to then use that to create you sales outreach sequences that you then adapt, feed in, put it into your sequences. That I'm all for. Like my my view on, on AI has been around, it's a process of augmentation as opposed to replication. We're not trying to take humans out of the process. We're just trying to remove some of the workload from them and help accelerate processes um so that's that's what we're seeing we also see we use it um internally as well and a lot of our clients use it is for trend analysis so we'll often um, have a, a bunch of sales conversations we can use those sales conversations to then analyze trends in that data what are certain things that are being said how often are they being said what are some of the market trends we're seeing um, and you can take it right down to the data level as well so we can actually start to say okay help generate these reports i mean the that was one of my favorite parts about the keynote release with andy petria inbound was you can now type in saying give me this report the ai goes away and will create the report as opposed to you having to click around and figuring out how you do it that is incredibly powerful especially when you're looking at the c-suite dashboards and reports are amazing that you can just ship them off to the c-suite but inevitably you'll get a question back going yeah but what's happening with this if you can then move that to the point where the c-suite can go well actually i can ask uh, AI the question myself and it generate a report and I see these things that is going to relieve a lot of pressure from that kind of end of month end of quarter end of year reporting that's that's great I think we've all been there and been asked you know turn around some slides some results in a couple of days so uh even a couple of hours actually um yeah. Rich one thing you touched on that I really love and something that we've seen at HubSpot too is when it comes to AI that idea of just you know we don't want to do the spamming lots of outreach but I think we also don't want to do pointless personalization um someone we work with yeah. said this recently like just because you can lead an email and say hey Rich I know you know you're in UK here's a couple fun facts about your town anyway here's what we're selling 
really using, I think, AI to help you craft something, but you still need to be the one, I think, to deliver yeah. the context and the value uh, for the prospect as well. Uh, Rich, so I think we have... Oh, go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one of these questions now. Um, so yes. if you had to pick one sales metric to focus on, what would it be? This is a really, really tough one. Um, I'm going to eliminate just like, you know, bottom line dollar from the answer that we can give here. I would focus on a thing called sales velocity. And that is the intersection of deal size as well at close deal size, as well as time to close, right? Um, there's actually a report in sales hub now, I think it's called sales velocity. And it helps you see kind of like a very, very high level the size of deals people are working, but also how fast are they closing them, right? Because we all want to close more deals. We also want to close them faster. So if I had to pick one metric I had to look at for success, especially on that rep or team level, I would go sales velocity. I think for me, and uh, and it might be more to do with the, the role that I sit in within the business, in, and because, but because it crosses so many different uh, departments, it is all about revenue. That is the only metric that I am, well, no, so it's not the only metric, but that is the key metric that I'm looking at and everything then starts to fold around that. From a, from a growth team perspective, revenue is the one that I am most concerned about or focused on because then everything else kind of feeds in around that. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Uh, Rich, do we have time for one more question? We do. Perfect. Um, we have a good one in here. We talk a lot about the five steps uh, to replicating sales excellence here. Could you maybe walk through or approach how you would use some of these five steps for things like deal review meetings, or even like when you're doing forecasting, how these five steps would really be introduced from your perspective? Yeah, so I think um, the five steps, not necessarily something that you would use on an ongoing basis, uh, as in some of the steps, yes, but the the health check. So we we do that. And then that is something that we would typically do on a quarterly basis. So from a deal review basis, you wouldn't necessarily be doing that. Sales dashboard, pretty self-explanatory. It's surfacing that data. It's giving you insight. It's giving you access to be able to get the insights that you need to then have intelligent conversations around um, all of um, uh, kind of your sales activity. Sales methodology. For the yes, sales methodologies are pretty kind of set. Like MedPick, you understand the things around that. But actually, when we were using Bant and uh, GPCT and kind of the natural evolution in our sales process. And our sales process is probably the most heavily um, uh, tinkered with part of our business. But those sales methodologies for us have always been something that we kind of tweak, we adjust, we say, uh, like we look at um, elements within that. And if you're using something like MedPick, and before I showed with the, the scoring elements, you start to adjust the scoring based on what you're seeing. So actually we're overweighting that or underweighting that, we can start to build that in. So yes, that is something we would do. Review meetings, yes, that's part of the general um, deal review meetings as well. And then the last one, uh, introduce sales. So yeah, there's probably, I would say, sales dashboards, methodology and the review meetings are the ones that we're doing um, on a continual basis. Alex, I think we're probably um, at time now. Should we, should we let these good people go? I think so. Yeah. Well, uh, do you want to flip back to the RevOps maturity model slide so everyone can grab that QR code if you haven't already? But yeah, Rich, thanks so much for having me. It was so great to talk with Six uh, and learn more about those five steps to replicating excellence. And again, don't forget, access your free RevOps maturity model here. But Rich, I'll leave it to you to close things out. Um, yeah, th thanks for joining us, everybody. If anybody's got any um, questions following on from us, you can reply to the emails um, that you'll get. They will go to a, an actual human in an actual uh, inbox. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions or if you want us to actually walk through and show you some of these features, by all means, um, ping us a message and we can show you uh, some of these tools. Um, yeah, uh, Alex, AI will not be the tool, uh, be the respondent in this. But yeah, it was great to have everybody. Um, and hopefully see you again at some point soon. Thanks again, Alex. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, everyone, for joining.